Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Outlook for GCC Construction. This is a special webinar uh, examining the trends, the opportunities and the challenges facing the Gulf construction industry in 2021 and 2022. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Richard Thompson. I am the editorial director of Meads and I will be the host for today's show. So the GCC construction industry is at a critical point uh, after five very tough years. Um, COVID in 2020 saw a, 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 an effective collapse in the value of contract awards in the construction industry in the GCC. And last year, 2020, was in fact the worst year of the decade in terms of con contract awards. Uh, and that comes after five years of uh, slowing economic activity, cuts to government spending. Uh, and a reduction in new projects coming to the market. In total, over the past three years in the GCC, construction activity has fallen each year as the value of project completions has eclipsed the value of new project awards. And at the same time, payment delays, disputes, and the lack of new uh, orders have hit contractor and construction industry cash flow. Um, as a consequence of that crunch in the industry, over the past 18 to 24 months, we've seen leading international contractors leaving the region, and we've seen other major names, particularly Arab tech in the UAE, uh, going out of business. So the key question in the middle of 2021, as we see sort of a broader economic recovery post-COVID, is has the construction market bottomed out in the GCC uh, and can we start looking forward to this, a, a new growth cycle? So at a macroeconomic level, we're seeing a recovery globally in, the, uh, in economic output. That's uh, as an, a result of the um, immunization programs. Um, oil prices have rebounded on the back of that. In Saudi Arabia, we're seeing a, a steady stream now of contracts and tenders for construction work. Uh, and in Dubai, uh, in the last few months, we're starting to see a pickup in segments of the real estate market. Behind all of that, we've got um, government stimulus spending, particularly in Saudi Arabia, but across the region and even around the world, uh, that is um, accelerating some of this recovery from COVID. So has the GCC construction industry uh, reached a turning point? Over the next hour, uh, we will look at this question and we will look at the outlook for GCC construction. And to do that, I'm joined by uh, Mead's deputy editor, Colin Foreman, who is without doubt the world's leading expert on uh, GCC construction. Um, Colin is here to answer my questions and to answer your questions and to add his insights. Um, I do you know, suggest or invite you to submit your questions using the, the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we will do our best to answer them. Colin, welcome. Thank you very much for your time today. I know how busy you are, uh, so we do appreciate it. Um, I just wonder, I, I've given a few sort of summary remarks. Do you have any thoughts to add uh, to where we are, the GCC construction industry in the middle of 2021? Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Richard. You've embarrassed me a little bit there, but I'll carry on. Um, yeah, I think the interesting thing to just ask on the big picture level is just how are we gonna look back on 2020 and 2021 in five years time? And I think what, what you said there about a turning point, I think we probably will look at um, the last year, 18 months, as a period where things changed. And I think really, if we look at just everything in general, there's been a bit of a reset with the pandemic. And I think we're seeing that in construction. That doesn't mean that everything's gonna change. I think we're still gonna have a lot of the old ever present underlying issues, but I think quite a lot of, um, uh, quite a lot of relationships, quite a lot of, equilibriums and things in the way the market operates have changed over the last 18 months. And I think we're in for a very interesting few years ahead just to see how that pans out. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as I said, if you have questions for Colin or me um, or anyone at the Meet team, um, we can answer them after the webinar. Please send them in using the, the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen and we will, uh, we will try to answer them as we go. So, um, 
Today's broadcast uh, is aligned with the publication of a new research report from Mead called GCC Construction Outlook 2021. That report is launched uh, today um, and you can uh, find out more about that report and indeed you can get slides from today's uh, broadcast. We've prepared slides taken from that report. Uh, you can access those slides for free along with some sample pages and some information using the link that you can see on the right hand, uh, sorry, on the left hand side of your screen at the moment. So the buy.me.com uh, hashtag thank you link, that will um, give you access to the slides from today uh, and information from the GCC construction report. Um, you should have an email from me that's just arrived in your inbox also um, telling you about, with that link and telling you about an exclusive bundle offer for the report plus a subscription to me.com as well. And you can see the details at the bottom half of this slide. So that should be in your inbox right now. Okay, um, what I'd like to do now is just look at some stories that we've published on me.com in the past seven days. Uh, these are all construction stories. They're all GCC stories. Um, they've all been through Colin and his team of reporters. And I think that I've selected them because I think they capture some of the, the key themes um, that we're going to talk about today. So let's just go through these um, before we get into the, some of the data slides. The first story, LNG project starts uh, to boost Qatar construction. Now, um, at the start of this year, uh, Qatar Petroleum awarded a $17 billion EPC contract to Chioda and Technique uh, as part of the, the Northfield uh, gas field expansion um, program. In the past week, uh, a $2.3 billion construction contract has been awarded to CCC as part of that. And this comes just as the, all the World Cup projects are beginning to sort of come to completion. So we think this is an important moment for uh, an important award for the uh, construction industry in Qatar. Colin, what are your thoughts? Qatar previously and over the past decade has been one of the stellar construction markets, um, aside from the sort of political problems. Um, is this now the key to Qatar construction, this LNG project? Yeah, I think if we just look back to 2017, when the moratorium on the North Field was lifted, we expected this project to go ahead. Um, the timelines at the time, you were sort of expecting it to start to move towards construction uh, around the time of the World Cup. It's a little bit easy to forget this, but the World Cup is about a year away now. Um, so it, it's getting quite close as a result of that. A lot of the building programs that have been undertaken over the last decade ahead of the World Cup are now in the finishing stages. So there's a lot of work being finished in Qatar. And if, if we cast our minds back to say 2009, 2010, looking at the Qatar market, there was a bit of a question of, you know, what comes next? They built a lot of, um, projects in the early 2000s, there'd been the LNG, original LNG program there. There'd also been the Asian Games in 2006, and there'd also been a lot of real estate development. So Qatar was a little bit of a, a sort of a, what does it do next? And then all of a sudden the World Cup um, was awarded to them. If I remember rightly in 2011, but I might have got that wrong. Um, and then following that, uh, we know what then happened. There's been a, a lot of projects followed. Um, direct projects such as the stadium, but then a lot of indirect infrastructure work such as the metros, highways, and an up, uh, additional terminal at the airport and so on. So I, I, I think there's been a little bit of a question as what comes after the World Cup. We got visibility of that in 2017, as I said, when the moratorium got lifted. And we're starting to see that now. So it's quite nice that you, you're seeing what's expected starting to come through. So. For construction, okay, it's an oil and gas project, but it's an awful lot of construction supply chain that gets engaged in these things. The scale of it's absolutely massive. So that will keep the supply chain busy. I expect there will be other um, projects can, coming through in Qatar. There's an expectation that things like Doha Bay crossing will start to come through as well. And then- Do you, do you think that it, some of that stuff might, you know, obviously they've got the World Cup to focus on and there's, a, there's going to be a slight, not a delay, but you know the strategic uh, 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 um, scheduling of things like the shark crossing, etc., just to get the World Cup out of the way, and then we. Yeah, can... I think I think even if they push the button on um, shark crossing to move ahead quite quickly, it's not going to move into construction until the World Cup's finished. Um, 
the the interesting thing as well is if we've got an LNG project starting if you remember back in the early 2000s in the late 90s when that was happening we then had the Asian Games we have another Asian Games in Doha in 2030 now there's an awful lot of sporting infrastructure in Doha now so I don't think there's going to be a, a they're not yeah. starting from scratch, put it that way, but I expect there'll be some uh, some work following on from that as well. So I think there's some some positive um, underlying drivers there for the, the Qatar construction market. I wouldn't call these necessarily stimulus projects. I think they uh, they stand up on their own merits, certainly the, the LNG uh, yeah. that does, but I think the impact of them, it, it will be a stimulus for the Qatar economy. Uh, I guess uh, with the LNG, because it's a strategic long-term project rather than a stimulus reaction to COVID, then, then we know it's not going to go away. It's it's hardwired yep. into the plans. Yep. Okay, yep. Let, uh, we, if you have questions on Qatar, please send them in. I, I, I want, I'm conscious of time. So the second headline is about NEOM project, the $500 billion giga project in the uh, Northwest of Saudi Arabia. Um, bidders have been given more time on a couple of pipeline projects there. Um, but I think NEOM is just worth mentioning because it's so big and we're now seeing a sort of rollout. What, what are your thoughts on NEOM, Colin? Yeah, I, I think NEOM launched in 2017 had largely been a, a sort of a planning, sort of conceptual kind of story really for, for three years. And over the last six months, it's really moved into an actual construction story. So we're, we're seeing quite a lot of tendering. Uh, starting to see some award as well and it's really picking up pace quite quickly uh, so I, I think it's probably uh, going to build up into be the, the the largest construction story in the region if it all goes to plan it opens up all sorts of questions the the, the scale of it the location the, the just the ambition the complexity it, it's it, it's the biggest story in the in, in the region by far when it comes to I'll tell you what, let, and, let's and it's starting to build up now. Let's keep some of your powder dry on the, on Neom and the the PIF project specifically because we've got some slides later on uh, and we can go into a bit more detail. I just want to get through these kind of this week's headlines. The third one on the slide is the uh, Saudi Arabia has announced a 147 billion dollar investment program for its transport sector. So this covers aviation rail, including the, the, the mega land bridge project, roads and ports. Um, it seems pretty significant. It's part of Vision 2030 and to get the logistics sector up to about 10% of GDP in Saudi from currently 6%. As I understand it, for this 147 billion, the government intends to spend 35% of that and they want private investment for the remaining 65%. So a lot of PPP or private uh, BOT developments, um, and it's a key part of diversifying the economy away from oil. So this seems to me like the biggest story of the week in terms of long-term uh, long things. What do, you, what do you think about Saudi transport? Yeah, I think it's a critical um, part of their development plans, just thinking about it in, in very simple terms. A lot of what they're planning, the sort of the NEOMs, the Red Sea projects, even the expansion of, of, of Riyadh as a city, none of this really works unless you upgrade the transport infrastructure. Or well, certainly you, you, you won't get the most out of these, these projects unless you upgrade the connectivity for all of these things. So transport really is the key to making all of this work. So the fact that they're doing this doesn't surprise me, given everything else that they want to do. Quite a lot of that announcement had been indicated before. It, it, it's not completely new, but it's good that they're they're reaffirming that it that it's it, it's on the drawing board. I think the other interesting one there is the airline. I think that's going to be quite important, certainly with the, the tourism ambitions and this idea that they want to the Riyadh to become a regional hub. I think it's sort of what I talked about initially was sort of connectivity within the kingdom to to maximise the benefit of projects. But also they need connectivity to the rest of the world to position itself on the on the global stage. So I, th I think transport and logistics really are crucial to um, Saudi Arabia's plans for the future. Do you, what, what's your thought on? I mean, transport is quite interesting because obviously we've had the disruption to the travel markets over the past eighteen months from from the pandemic, and Saudi itself has had plans to privatise its airports for uh, you know a decade and or maybe not a decade, maybe five years. Uh, that haven't gone according to plan. Is your sense that 
you know, if 65% of this investment is to come from private investors, is there appetite there? Is, um, I, I, Saudi... I, think, I, I think it's difficult. I think that not just in Saudi Arabia, transports proved to be difficult in some cases to, to get private sector investment. So I, I think that's going to be a, a real challenge. And I think it's, we're going to end up coming back to the old uh, sort of the devil's in the detail and the amount of risk risk sharing that goes on with the private sector and the uh, and the government, which we won't really find out about until uh, things start to move towards the sort of the tender process. So I, th I think that's going to be very interesting to watch. And you're, you're right to right to bring that up. Just one other thing, which I think is important to uh, uh, just sort of add, is that okay, we're talking about a lot of investment there. And it feels like it's a lot of uh, something new for the kingdom. But, you know, we need to remember that really over the last 10 years, uh, Saudi Arabia spent an awful lot on transport infrastructure. If we take Riyadh Metro on its own, that's 23, yeah. 24 billion, probably will end up costing more. Uh, Jeddah Airport, just off the top of my head, that, that those two things combined um, gets you quite a significant chunk of uh, transport investment. And there's been a lot of other railways and all sorts of other things invested. So I don't really see this as a, a new trend in Saudi Arabia. I think it's just a continuation of, what, of what's been going on. Sort of parceling up and presenting a, uh, a summary of what they've got. Yeah, yeah or, or, you know, sort of the next chapter, really. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Now, um, we have had a question um, in about resources. So I'll just read the question briefly, you know, following on from the uh, my introductory comments uh, that companies are leaving the region, internationals are leaving the region, and we've had some bankruptcies, uh, and I mentioned Aerotech, uh, where will the capacity come from to deliver these, the GCC's uh, building programs, you know, what protections and incentives will need to be offered. Now, three of the headlines on this slide relate to this issue about costs and capacity. So specifically, we've got a story that you wrote, Colin, about Saudi Arabia revives its super contractor plans, which is a very interesting story. Saudi Arabia goes on the hunt for contractors and then Saudi import rules will increase construction costs. So what are your thoughts on, you know, these stories and that um, issue of capacity? Yeah, uh, I mean, this has been a, a a growing concern over the last, I think, three, four years. If we, if we look back to, say, 2017, when a lot of these major projects were announced, there was a real feeling that there's going to be a, a resource question. That wasn't really a, an immediate issue. Uh, and as I said, a lot of these things like NEOM are starting to move quite quickly into the construction phase, and that question is becoming really quite immediate now. So yes, I think that's a, a major challenge. I think it's a, a lot of different levels. I think it affects the supply chain right from the top to the bottom. If we look at the thing that we actually know about at the moment, which tends to be the consultancy capacity, I think they're being tested. I think it's pretty difficult for them to get enough people or the right caliber of people to, to go to Saudi Arabia to work. So it's difficult to staff up jobs. Um, so I think that's a challenge. We're now starting to get main contractors move into the kingdom. Again, that's um, proving to be slightly difficult. And as I've mentioned, that we're starting to see measures being put into place that will try and address those concerns. So what's happening with this, what I call super contractor, is that they're trying to create a, national, a series of national champions, so big heavyweight construction firms that will be able to take on government or government related entity work in the kingdom and, and help solve some of this um, so this resource question. Do we know anything about the, the, how many national champions, you know, do they want, do they have an idea to have two or three or? I, I think it will be a handful, but that's not a precise answer, but I, I would imagine it will be sort of three, four, five of them. Well, it, I, I, know I, that, I don't um, know that, but I, I mean, the, the, the question then still remains. I mean. It, it, I think one of the, the easy things to forget about construction is you sort of think, well, okay, I've, I've got a main contractor in place that solved my, my, my resource issue, but construction doesn't really work like that. A main contractor sits above a supply chain and manages it. And if the supply chain below it is crippled and has had to take on a lot of debt over the last five years, uh, a, a main contractor's ability to actually get things going is limited. So I, I think, yes, uh, setting up contractors will help the problem, but I think it just pushes it down further. And we're, we're going to have to see 
um, some measures to, to really reinvigorate the supply chain. It's been a very difficult five, yeah. six years for the supply chain since 2014. Isn't, isn't that the point though, by having a list of super contractors, they have some sort of predictability or visibility over a pipeline so they can invest in resources. Yes, yeah, that's true. But I, I, I think the, the, the difficulty is that a lot of projects were certainly so far are looking to be procured on, on razor thin margins, which isn't much of an incentive for um, certainly the supply chain to, uh, to, to invest. So I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done there. But uh, looking at the glass half full, uh, they're setting up, setting up businesses and things to try and solve this problem. So it's a, a step in the right direction, but I don't think it's a, a, a silver bullet solution. I think there's still a lot of work to be done and it, it's going to be a work in progress. And it's, it's, a, real, it's a real problem for, uh, for the, the viability of some of these projects. So they're already talking about escalation and, and, and the problem of rising material costs. And I yeah. think this is it, inflation is going to be a, a, a major challenge going forward. So the import rules that have been uh, amended, which ex mean that some of the exemptions that would apply for materials and goods coming from free zones within the region, for example, just nudges up the costs uh, even more. I don't think that's a, a particularly major issue for the construction industry in, in the long term, but it's just an, an example of something else which is uh, you know, pushing that um, uh, pushing that inflation a little bit higher. So I think this, uh, I think it's going to be a real source of tension, and it's coming at a time when client bodies want want very very competitive pricing. So it's it, it, it's quite a difficult quite a difficult situation at the moment. Okay, uh, now um, a couple of questions. We'll just try and get them quickly answered. So. Uh, somebody has asked about the, the, the Saudi transport strategy. Does it include GCC railway project? Now, my understanding is it includes everything that's in railways in Saudi Arabia. They want to increase from currently 5,350 kilometres of railway to 8,080 kilometres of railway. Um, but it's not targeted at the GCC railway. That's just part of it. Is that correct, Colin? Or do you, do you know if that segment is included? Uh, that, that's my understanding. I think what's going on at the moment with some of the, the, the regional issues that we see. So uh, they don't appear to be working together on pan GCC uh, projects at the moment. So I, I don't think that's on the, at the top of the agenda. And it'll be interesting to see who decides to take leadership on, on, the, on the GCC rail. I think the UAE has has moved forward with Etihad Rail quite quickly. So I think they would be quite keen to have connectivity in through Saudi Arabia and beyond. There's definitely an opportunity there. It's, it, it's something which uh, could really enhance trade within the region. But at the moment, I think it's, uh, I think there is work that is being done there, but I, I think it's, it's not gonna come through that quickly. Okay. It's uh, interesting though, isn't it? If the UAE, which is pushing ahead with Etihad Rail, uh, and Saudi pushes ahead with Landbridge. That's two major parts of a potential GCC railway. Obviously, yes. we're talking about several years down the line, but it's you know the the, the pieces are falling in, potentially falling into place. Just yeah, finally, I think before, that, sorry, I, I, I think that uh, I think the most difficult bits really will be the little bits connecting. I I, I think the, the the main bits of railway that go through a. a, a relatively easy for a government that's got complete control of a project within its country to move ahead it's the it's the connecting bits which i think will yeah. will prove to be difficult okay Not from no, an just, engineering point of view but from a from a, a regulation a, a, a political point of view yeah um yeah as is always the case in in this part of the world um the the second from the bottom on this slide just one more story before we, we move on inflection point for Middle East construction. So this was from Neha Bhatia meets construction and infrastructure editor. Um, and she was looking at the sort of value of awards versus the value of completions. What, what are your thoughts? Just, and we're going to touch on this later on as well, but are we at a turning point or an inflection point? Yeah, I, th I think that story uh, highlights quite a few things. I think the thing that's important to remember is that we're it's quite easy to get excited about all the, the, the new projects that seem to be moving forwards and the tendering activity that's going on 
but it's also important to remember there's an awful lot of work being finished at the moment uh, across the region and and that's really leaving contractors and, and, and suppliers with a, a bit of an issue they've, they've not got workload they're finishing up jobs and they haven't got new jobs to go on to so i think it's going to be quite a painful period for a lot of companies as they're they're not getting in as much new work as they are they're already completing the signs are that that situation will start to improve uh, but i think it's going to be an ongoing challenge for uh, certainly the next year two years okay thank you now um that that, that was just to cover um what's happened in the last week and you, you know meet.com is putting out those stories every day colin and his team so if you want to sort of get into the detail I'll go to meet.com for that but that's just the past week, but it's touched on some of the current themes. I want to now spend uh, a few minutes just going through some slides that I've taken from the uh, from the GCC construction report, just looking back at the trends over the past uh, four or five years. Um, so what I propose to do is I'll go through four or five slides uh, and then we'll, we'll get Colin's comments on, on some of these trends. So the slide that is in front of you now uh, shows the value of construction and transport infrastructure project contract awards in um, from over the past decade. So it's the annual value of construction contract awards over the past decade. Uh, what you can see, I mean, the obvious thing is in 2020, $42.5 billion worth of uh, construction contracts were awarded in the GCC. That is the lowest value. The worst year of the past decade in terms of construction contract awards was last year, obviously because of COVID uh, and the lockdowns. But you can see over the previous uh, four years, 2017, 2018, 2019, as well as 2020, the value has been down on the peak years from 2013, 2014. Uh, 2016 through to 2019, an average of about $61 billion a year were awarded in the GCC, and that slumped to 20, uh, 42 and a half last year, and that was 26% down year on year. So a huge crash in the value of awards, construction awards last year. That is then reflected, if we look at that, if we set the value of awards against the value of project completions, that gives us some indication of the level of activity that's underway. And this chart uh, that you can see is the, the annual change in value of construction projects that are underway in the GCC. So it's the value of completions minus the value of awards. And you can see in 2020, uh, the market had a net loss in the value of construction projects uh, of about $24.3 billion. That follows a, 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 in 2019, a $32 billion net loss in the value uh, of construction awards. So two years, even though the graph is showing a slight uptick in 2020, it's still a net loss. There's a reduction in the value of construction awards and um, actually over the past four years going back to 2017 we had a slight uptick in, in 2018 but it was very minimal uh, a general decline in the value of um, the net value of construction activity and at the bottom right hand side of this side we've got some data that's taken from meets parent company global data looking at construction gdp and we can see in the five markets mentioned construction output in 2020 declined uh, by a substantial amount, I mean, Oman, Oman and Kuwait, nearly 10% uh, fall in the value of construction output in 2020, but across the region, uh, output was down. So the story is a shrinking construction market over the past yeah. four Richard, years. If we could yes. get back to that slide, Richard, I think it's really important to highlight a couple of things on that chart, and it also applies to the previous chart, but particularly that chart. Uh, when we were talking at the beginning, we were saying, how are we going to look back on the last 18 months and five years time? And it's interesting when you look at that, you can look back at what happened in history. So if you look at 2011, uh, the market started to show, show, show signs of improving. And really what happened then, you had the Arab Spring. So that, that seemed to prove to be a catalyst for Dubai real estate as investments started coming into property in Dubai. But more importantly, it really spurred a lot of governments on to spend a lot of money, particularly on social infrastructure, which drove yeah. that drove that number higher. So I would say that was a turning point there, which we can remember quite clearly, and it was quite a traumatic event. And then so what, the other what one, you're pointing to there is that uh, hump in 2012, 2013, 2014. That was a result. Well, of well more importantly, the pickup that starts at around 2011 and 12. 
Then the other traumatic event that comes is the drop in oil prices in the second half of 2014, which looking back was probably the most significant event for the projects market over the last decade. And that, that changed an awful lot of things. And then we're now in a position, if we look at the graph, where it looks like things might be changing again, but we don't have the benefit of hindsight yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, if I just carry on with some of my, um, with a couple more slides. So this one um, looks at the, the balance of awards versus completions by country. And we can see here the blue, the blue bar shows the value of projects that have completed in the year 2020, and the red bar shows the value of new awards in 2020. So in the UAE, uh, clearly uh, the most obvious disparity between uh, completions and awards are 17, a net 17 and a half billion dollar loss in the value of construction project activity in the UAE. Qatar, uh, a similar um, disparity, but not on the same scale, about a, a 4.5 billion dollar loss. And in fact, the only market that didn't see a, a, a net loss in the value of awards last year, uh, in the value of construction activity last year was Saudi Arabia, which had a, a slight gain. Saudi, of course, we must remember is the biggest market in town. So, um, the fact that it is gaining and it's on that trajectory is, is very positive. But generally, uh, it was a, the worst year of the past decade uh, across the GCC. Um, if we just look at this slide before we get to Colin's sort of general comments, if he has any more, um, these are the top sort of the biggest construction spenders uh, in 2020. Uh, this is data taken from the GCC construction report. Uh, the top Five are all Saudi or UAE. Uh, PIF, the Public Investment Fund, by far the biggest, and that is being driven by things like NEOM uh, in terms of projects underway. Uh, Colin, um, any thoughts on just this is just a brief look back over the past four or five years, and you've already made some points. Do, is there anything further you want to add? Not really. I, I mean, the only uh, comment I would have is this, that these numbers tend to favor the people with very large master planned yeah um, developments okay thank you right uh, just a reminder that all of these slides have come from the gcc construction outlook report which is published today by the mead insight team and you can see some of the bullet points there on the benefits and features of the report um i've just taken a few sort of uh, headline slides for today's broadcast in your inbox there is an email from me with a link to sample pages from the report plus today's slides uh, and you can find out everything you need by clicking on the link that will be in your inbox uh, right now from, from me. Okay, now let's look forward a little bit. I want to start with a couple of slides uh, looking at the macroeconomic picture. As I mentioned, we're seeing, because of the immunization programs and stimulus spending and monetary easing policies around the world, the global economy is, is pretty quickly uh, picking up activity. Um, and that's, of course, boosting oil prices and feeding into a positive outlook for the GCC region. So the red line on this chart shows the GDP growth, real GDP growth. So that's adjusted for inflation uh, in the GCC. And we can see in 2020, a, a, a decline of minus 4.8% in real GDP growth in the GCC based on the IMS numbers, uh, turning to a 2.7% uh, increase in GDP growth um, in 2021 and followed by 3.8 percent growth in 2022. Each country is slightly different but that's the GCC figure on average so basically we're seeing a broad pickup in the economic outlook based on the sort of recovery from COVID and the re returning to some sort of normality uh, thanks to the immunizations. Uh, and in terms of oil prices, um, this morning or yesterday, oil prices, uh, Brent crude was $77.5 a barrel. Uh, today, it's dropped a little bit or had this morning to about 75, but it's still way, way up on where it was in 2020. On average, the first six months of the year, oil prices have averaged 61, uh, sorry, $63 a barrel in, uh, um, in 2021. That's similar levels to 2019. Last year, it was about 41. So you can see a significant step change in in oil prices, uh, that will ease the fiscal pressures on government spending. But we must always remember 
uh, that we have got reduced output levels. So whilst the prices are up, the actual volumes are down uh, for the region's exporters and Saudi Arabia is suffering the most. There's the biggest producer, it has the biggest caps on its production. So it's not quite as simple as just oil prices, but it's definitely a more positive picture. Colin, any thoughts on the macroeconomic outlook or oil price outlook? Yeah, I, I think the interesting thing is just what's going on at the moment with the um, discussion about the OPEC meeting. And I think really what you're seeing is that the UAE saying that they want to um, have their baseline reset is there's a feeling that, that things are going to improve and there's, a, there's a, a new cycle starting and you want to be in the best possible position for the start of that, that new cycle. So I, I think there's quite a bit of... Um, cautious optimism about what's going to happen over the next five years. Okay, thank you very much. Right, so that's the economic macro outlook. Let's look at the, um, the projects, uh, the construction projects outlook. So I've got a few slides now, again, taken from the GCC construction report, which look at the pipeline of construction and transport projects in the GCC. So uh, in total, uh, there is about there are about $1.5 trillion worth of construction and transport infrastructure projects planned in the, uh, the GCC. So these are the ones that have not yet been awarded for construction. Um, the vast majority, about 90% uh, plus, uh, are at the study or the design phase. Um, and that's normal. Uh, you know, so, as Colin mentioned earlier, some of these are master plans and things that will take many years to come. But it's important to note that there are about $107 billion worth of construction and transport project contracts currently at some stage of tendering, whether it's you know, early pre-qualification or uh, bid evaluation. $107 billion, that, that is, we would expect that that will be, you know, most of those are, those will be the ones that are awarded in the next 18 months or so. Given that last year we saw 42 and a half billion of awards to have, 107 billion uh, at some stage of tendering does suggest there is a backlog that we're going to see once once a bit of confidence returns we are, uh, there is potential for a quick pickup in contract awards which could uh, have a knock-on effect on inflation and, and capacity of course um, if we look at the actual segments uh, of the market so this pie chart looks at that 1.5 trillion dollar pipeline of construction and transport awards it shows that um, the biggest section there, mixed use, the majority uh, of planned projects are commercial real estate projects. And that again is normal. You usually see a much bigger uh, segment of, of property uh, projects. But on the left-hand side, infrastructure, uh, about $180 billion worth of infrastructure projects planned. And I think following on from Colin's comments about what happened after the Arab Spring in 2011 and the importance of stimulus packages now, infrastructure could be the area where we see most immediate opportunities. So if I just stop for breath there, Colin, what are your thoughts on those two slides about the, the sort of the, the pipeline of stuff that's being tendered, you know, that we could see in the next hundred, uh, the next year and a half, and about this shift towards infrastructure? Do you agree with those thoughts? Yeah, my concern for the, the, the stuff that's in the tender process at the moment is a lot of those uh, tenders will have been submitted at a time and when business models will have changed recently. Um, there'll be a, a view on what's happened with costs. The outlook's changed. There's a bit of uncertainty. So I think there's a, there's a chance that quite a lot of that um, stuff that's in the tender process at the moment doesn't actually, actually move ahead. So I think that there's, there's a possibility for a, a bit of downside there. On the on the mix of the, the things that are coming through. I think in the past that a lot of the large mixed use master plan developments and the numbers that we, we put up earlier showed that was in the UAE. So there was the likes of Dubai Holding, which had things like Dubai Land, I think was on their books for a, a very long time, which made them one of the largest clients. I think in the UAE, it's gonna be a, a much more tactical real estate market, I think you'll see developers doing uh, specific projects in specific areas that that have sort of unique selling points and, and really cater to this, a specific market. I think where you'll see the large mixed use real estate development projects 
uh, as we discussed earlier, will be in Saudi Arabia. I think the market dynamics are very different in Saudi Arabia to the rest of the UAE. So I think the, the very big program and uh, programs of work and very ambitious uh, major projects that we've kind of got accustomed to in the Middle East over, over the years are going to be found in Saudi Arabia over the next few years rather than the rest of the region. And I think the rest of the region is going to be a lot more specific individual uh, building projects. And again, on infrastructure, uh, as we said earlier, to, to make a lot of those big things work, you need a lot of transportation and other infrastructure to make them work. And I think that's where you're going to see uh, a lot of the bigger infrastructure schemes going forward. That said, I think there will be a, a requirement to upgrade infrastructure in other markets and, and use infrastructure as an enabler for, for future economic growth. So I think infrastructure will be is slightly different, but for the, the big uh, ambitious uh, projects that we, we've come used to seeing, I think Saudi Arabia is the place for them going forward. So um, you, you, you think, if I can just sort of crystallize what I think you were saying that infrastructure is probably going to be a strong area of opportunity for construct relatively strong area of opportunity for construction companies in the in the near term yeah yeah uh, and um, on the on the on the biggest sort of uh, master plan projects in Saudi but it's important to say that you know the rest of the markets aren't going to completely drop off I think there's I think there's quite a lot of um, specific projects that will go ahead and What's good about that is that they're, they're probably quite, well, they will be quite real real projects that have a real sort of customer base and can be sold and, uh, and, and can move ahead. So, okay, it's not quite as ambitious and doesn't require as much work as things in the past, but it, they should be real opportunities. Okay, and we've had a couple of questions. Just on this slide, we mentioned the Bahrain uh, plans for a metro in Manama. Uh, we've had a couple of questions about metros. I mean, the, these are relatively frequent questions. Any update on Abu Dhabi Metro and any update on Dubai Metro extension project? So I suspect there is no update on Abu Dhabi, but what do you, do you have anything on those two projects? Yeah, I, I think Bahrain and possibly Dubai as well are, are, are very interesting and they feed back into that Saudi transport and private sector involvement. The Bahrain Metro projects going forward as a PPP. There's been discussions about the future lines planned for Dubai Metro going forward as a PPP as well. And it's, I, I think they're going to be test projects to watch just to see how effectively the private sector can be engaged to to, to do these things. The, as always, there's a bit of um, cynicism about whether it can be done, but in Bahrain, they're, they're, they're planning to go ahead with the tender this year. So, so hopefully we'll, we'll find out what happens fairly shortly. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, keep your questions coming. We've got loads to get to, um, but not so much time left. Uh, next, I want to move on to, um, still looking at the pipeline of projects, but I want to look at geographies and particularly uh, here looking at Saudi because it's such a big part of the pie uh, but we have had other uh, questions in as well so uh, this is the pie chart of that 1.5 trillion dollars worth of projects that are planned but not yet awarded Saudi Arabia has about 921 billion dollars worth of those so it's uh, by far the biggest share I think it's about 55 percent or something of the overall uh, pipeline of projects um, and about $58 billion worth of construction contracts are currently being tendered in the kingdom. Uh, this is being driven by, as, got, as Colin has already mentioned, sort of government strategic uh, plans to diversify the Saudi economy using the public in, uh, investment fund to drive projects like NEOM. So I just want to present a slide on the PIF. So most people will know the public investment fund uh, formed in 1971, basically as a sovereign fund uh, to invest overseas to, you know, to provide uh, non-oil revenue streams into Saudi Arabia. Over the past five or six years, it's been um, restructured, reformed, reconstituted to become uh, a key driver of uh, some Saudi Arabia's domestic diversification plans and the key player in the Vision 2030 program. Um, PIF plans to spend, invest about $40 billion a year uh, on domestic projects and investments. Uh, it is, aims to add $320 billion a year onto the 
so the uh, GDP, non-oil GDP through its projects uh, by 2030 and create 1.8 million direct and in, indirect jobs. Sorry, that second bullet point, that's 330 billion by 2025, not 2030. And on the left-hand side of this diagram, uh, PIF is focusing on 13 key investment sectors and you can see them uh, listed there. Now, many of the PIS projects are being delivered through project companies. Now, this isn't a comprehensive list of all of the PIS portfolio project companies, but it's, uh, it's the main ones or the biggest ones. Uh, we, can't, we don't have time to go through each of them, but um, Colin, you started to say some thoughts on NEOM earlier. I just wonder if you want to comment on any of these companies or indeed on the PIF itself on who we should be paying more attention to them. Yeah, I think in very broadly speaking, a lot of these things were launched around the 2017, not all of them, but most of them were launched around that time. And they've had a few years in the planning stage and they're now really moving into construction. So the, 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 the more advanced ones have got about a year of construction work under their belts and the others are, are catching up quite quickly. So I think it's it, it's really building critical mass as, as far as construction projects are concerned now. So uh, quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of things to uh, to look out for in the future. Okay. Now we've had a few questions about uh, Neom. Following your comments at the beginning, perhaps we can just quickly touch on on those as we go. So. Um, how likely is NEOM to be executed as originally planned? Well, that's quite an interesting question because there wasn't a lot of great detail in the original plan. It was more of a sort of overarching concept. And some of the plans such as the line project have actually changed uh, since the original. So is your sense that NEOM itself actually will change and reform and reshape just as we go? Yeah, I, um, I that hasn't been officially communicated but based on experience from other projects uh, in the past what's launched as the uh, you know the great launch video that comes out when the thing's launched and what's actually delivered are, are often very different that the concept will be the same the idea will, will remain the same but a, a lot of the details will change and and for various reasons you know whether it be value engineering um, feasibility um, just market changing, market requirements changing, uh, cost constraints, you know, all sorts of things. So, yeah, I, I think we'll we'll see quite a lot of uh, uh, change as these things as these things come through. So, yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's inevitable. I mean, if people that were around in 2002, if you look back at what Palm Jumeirah was meant to be look look like and what Palm Jumeirah looks like today, it, on the face of it, they're they're very similar. If you if you take the the sort of the the view from space it still looks like a palm island but actually what what's on the uh, on the islands is is very different to what was delivered and i i think you'll probably have a a similar thing happen at neom as, as the project progresses it's great there's a comment that has been submitted by one of our viewers today about neom it says going back to neom one report promotes it as the largest tourism project another report talks about it becoming silicon valley of saudi arabia uh, and now we learn about a pipeline between where to where I think that kind of neon is doing all of those things it's it's kind of it's partly a branding it's partly about bringing in investment it's partly about creating a new form of economy it's, it's doing all of those things isn't it or trying to do all of those things yeah i mean i think what we i think the original announcements were very um focused towards um future thinking so there was uh, as that viewer said there was the sort of the silicon valley idea there was the sort of the, the robot citizen, if people remember that. Uh, and then there was a little bit on the, the sort of the tourism play. And I think what's, uh, what's come through a bit more recently is some of the industrial development and the um, industrial city. And that's really looking to things like hydrogen. And while that might not be as, as headline grabbing, I, I find that quite positive because if we look at what's happened in Saudi Arabia over the last 40 years, they've been good at developing large scale industrial zones, which really leverage strategic advantages that the kingdom have. So uh, particularly Jabal and Yambu, you know, these are huge developments that have cost an awful lot of money to set up with, you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of investment. And Neom's looking to do 
uh, I wouldn't say something similar because I don't think it's the same thing, but it's it's similar in the idea that it's industrial development that, and Saudi Arabia knows how to do that. So I, I think the industrial side is is quite important. The future stuff I think is is difficult to to really envisage what what that's going to be. I think there's a, a real idea that they need to really go for being the best and push all the boundaries. And I think ultimately, as I said earlier, there'll be some there'll be some compromise on that. And then on the tourism side, I don't think that's really that much of a, a stretch to think about tourism working there. You know, we know that in Aqaba in Jordan, there's a lot of tourism development and it seems to work. And our, a little further around the, the Gulf of Aqaba, you, you have a lot of development in Egypt as well. But, which is tourism related. So I don't think those things on, on their own are, are particularly difficult to get your head around. I think it's when you put them all together, it becomes, it becomes quite overwhelming. And, and certainly the, the size of, uh, of Neom as well becomes, uh, becomes quite challenging. And the size and scale again, just to go back to that resource question, raises real questions about um, who's actually gonna build all of this. Well, on that, that's, we've got a couple of slides coming up on resources, but there is a question here about Turkish contractors. And I think this is quite interesting. So Turkish contractors have played a very important role in Saudi in, in recent years. Um, there have been various political uh, tensions between um, Ankara and Riyadh, you know, in the East Mediterranean and around the Qatar diplomatic crisis or the GCC diplomatic crisis. Um, is it your view that Turkish, nothing's really changed for, Turkish companies yeah, I, I, in, think, in... I think I think it's still uh, difficult for Turkish contractors in in Saudi Arabia I think the just looking at the facts really if we if, if we start discussing about international contractors that have the resource um, to take on this amount of work you really if you look at the you know for example the ENR international contractor list and the you know the world's largest contractors most of them now are Chinese, you know, something like seven out of 10 of them are Chinese. And if you look at some of the early awards at Neon, they're going, they're going Chinese as well. So I think you will find that Chinese contractors play um, quite a significant role in that project. In the, that's that's in it. The you know, we've talked already about infrastructure investment, you know, particularly on the transport and logistics side. We've talked already about Riyadh's intention to bring in outside capital and private investors. The Chinese obviously have the, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is all about logistics and infrastructure. So just following on from your comments there, can we expect, in your opinion, can we expect to see a significant ramping up of Chinese investment in infrastructure projects and therefore Chinese contractors in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I, I believe that that will be a, a significant trend over the next, the, the next five years. And it's it's easy to construct an argument where that's going to be the likely outcome. Uh, you've got a you've got a Saudi Arabia which is very keen to do things and is actually has to deliver things. It's made very public commitments to delivering things, so it has to deliver. The rest of the uh, the world's contractors are, I think, would be keen to be involved, but possibly don't have the scale and the and the willpower to really to really do it. And I think the Chinese are probably the most likely people to, to answer the call to deliver and are also more capable of bringing a lot of things like um, financing and being competitive on terms of cost as well. So I think it's, it's probably uh, the way things will just go. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have a question here about uh, what is your view of the impact of current, the current commodity cycle, especially steel price, price rises. Now we touched on this earlier. I have a couple of uh, slides here. One is uh, this slide about the supercontractor plans. We talked about this at the beginning of the broadcast. And a second slide, which was a recent cover story from Meet Business Review about the return of inflation and the, the super cycle. So perhaps um, if we just focus on this inflation story because the questioner has asked, is this now something that you think is structural? That we're going to see a long term yeah, I mean, rise in. Uh, I, I think we're seeing a. Uh, uh, an increase in prices, one, because of disruption to supply chains due to COVID, and two, there's a, a, a pickup in uh, pick up in demand. And there's also been, it depends on not just steel, but there's been a, 
a lack of investment in capacity and production capacity as well. So I think there's a number of factors at play there. I think this is really dangerous for the construction industry. If we, we look back over previous cycles, there's an awful lot of contractors and companies that go out of business because of the work that they take on out of desperation in a downturn and then get hit by inflation. And my fear is this will happen to, to people again. And the way prices have increased, that's a, a very real possibility. And it's something that I'm sure people are aware of, but it's it's really something that companies need to be careful of. But it's it's difficult at a time when you're desperate for work. Yeah, and I guess it's it's the the the, the short term thinking that has led to you know the problems that we described at the beginning of the program that is now going to um, potentially exacerbate the capacity crunch and the inflationary pressures. Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, and uh, we can all point to examples of projects that were awarded 10 years ago or uh, nearer 20 years ago, which then got hit by rising steel prices and were delayed for years and, uh, and, uh, and ended up as being a very painful experience for everybody involved. And, you know, the way prices have gone up, there's the possibility that that's going to happen again. OK, great. Um, now we're into the last couple of slides. I'm just going to do a couple of sort of overview sort of conclusion slides um, and then if we've got time we can look at some more questions so the economic outlook we're in recovery from covid but we're not out of the, the woods there are still some very real risks uh you know we have the new waves the risk of new waves of covid from new variants and we the the travel industry and the energy sector is still vulnerable to to shocks and uncertainty which means the region is vulnerable um, so many aspects of what we've had over the past 18 months will probably continue in terms of fiscal management, in terms of restrictions over the coming 18 months. But top line growth is recovering and oil prices are recovering. Um, we will see tight fiscal management measures continuing. You know, the fisc whilst oil prices are recovering, government finances have been really battered over the past five years and particularly over the last 18 months. Debt levels are rising, uh, drawdowns from sovereign wealth, uh, so savings and reserves are, are increasing, uh, increased borrowing and now inflation. So things like VAT and taxes and fees uh, likely to increase, plus localization regulations, uh, increasing the local content in projects. So all of that stuff that we've been talking about for the past five years will continue, in my opinion. Um, the reform efforts become more and more vital in terms of the fiscal approach. So privatization, public-private partnerships, decarbonization, localization, all of these things become very high political priorities. Um, there is a difference, of course, between planning PPPs and privatizations and delivering those things, but I think that we are seeing increased appetite because of necessity to, to go to PPP and privatization. Um, oil and gas remains a priority area for investment, so despite all the focus on renewables, oil is still the biggest source of global energy and revenues for this region. So we'll continue to see investment in oil and gas, but as part of an energy transition story that we'll see uh, continuing investment in renewables. Renewables has been affected by rising commodity prices, of course, uh, which affects the competitive position of solar. Um, but I think that trend will continue. Um, and I think there will be a general focus in the region to attract investment in R&D uh, and tech in the energy sector and the healthcare sectors in this region. Uh, for construction, uh, the outlook, and Colin, will, I'll give him a chance to sort of comment on these things at the end. So the outlook is for slow to moderate growth in the value of building and infrastructure projects in, in terms of contract awards in 2021 and 2022. Government stimulus will support near-term recovery particularly on infrastructure. Long-term outlook will be boosted by the global recovery and the strengthening oil prices and the reduction in the production caps from the producers, which will be phased out over the next year or less than a year. Um, contractors should be braced for continuing downward pressure on cash flow. You know, so the issues of pushing the cost down of slow contract award values, delayed payments, et cetera. Um, uh, the value of projects being completed in 2021 is still in the first half of the year higher than the value of new contract awards. Um, but depending on the pace of the economic recovery, which is looking good at the moment, um, 
the market should begin to turn positive in the second half of this year or more likely in 2022. So those are my summary thoughts from reading all of Colin's articles and the, the research report. Uh, and then I've highlighted some challenges. So COVID-19, the uncertainty, cash flow, we talked about new opportunities, where are they? Now Colin wrote an article on Mead, which, is to, which highlighted not just the challenge of finding new opportunities, but also sifting the good opportunities from the bad ones and spending time tendering on, you know, the risk of spending time tendering for projects that never get awarded. I just wonder, Colin, if you could give, if you want to sort of elaborate on that point, I took those bullets from, from something that you'd written. Um, what do you mean good opportunities from bad? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that get put out to tender, which is maybe a check price exercise by a client or someone try to work out their building costs that never move ahead. Yeah, and I think it's particularly important when the market's under pressure to really make sure that you're, you're pricing a real opportunity. Okay. Uh, another challenge is inflation and materials cost escalation. Colin just talked about that um, a few moments ago. And then localization. We, we started at the beginning, we talked about the new import rules in Saudi. These rules basically mean that um, not everything that's made in the GCC will be will benefit from um, the agreements, the pan GCC agreements for cross border sales. Um, they have to now have a certain percentage of local content or local value, um, added value, uh, which in this case, we're talking about Saudi regulations, potentially that puts up the price, but it's part of that narrative about increasing local content. Colin, how in your view and from what people tell you, is that becoming a, a bigger and bigger burden and a challenge? Uh, I think it's a bigger and bigger issue. I think maybe it's wrong to say that it's a, it's a burden, it's an opportunity, it's just the way the industry is changing. I think it's something that rather than viewing it as a burden, you should say, look, this is, this is what it is. How do, we, how do we deal with it and how do we make it work for us? So I, I think it's a real issue. It's, a, it's becoming a more and more important issue. Uh, I think it's here to stay. And it's important just to say this is not a uniquely Middle East phenomenon. This, is, this happens all over the world. So it's, it, it's not something unusual. It's just, just the, the way the world works, really. Okay. Now, um, just a reminder that a lot of the information for today's slides came from GCC Construction Outlook 2021, a new report from... Uh, the Mead Insight team, and you can find out more about the report, and indeed you can get all of today's slides uh, and video, the, this recording of this discussion with Colin, uh, at the link that's on your screen now, um, and also you should have an email from me in your inbox, which also provides this link, um, and everything you need uh, from today will be at that link. We, we've come to the end of our time, I'm going to take a few more, I'm going to abuse uh, our slot just for a, a few more questions, just for Colin, whilst, uh, for quick ones. Colin, is Qatar still an attractive market for international contractors? I think it, there is work there for international contractors, as we've seen certainly uh, related to oil and gas. I think it depends a little bit on what things move forward. There are some major infrastructure schemes planned, such as Doha Bay Crossing, which is clearly attractive for a, a major contractor. There could be further, further work on the metro, and some of the road schemes are quite big as well, which they may uh, decide to pursue. So, yeah, I think there will still be work. But just to state the obvious, Qatar, although it's quite a quite an active market and does have quite a lot of opportunity. It, it's still small in, in scale when compared to A, the UAE, but more importantly to Saudi Arabia. Uh, what about projects in Oman is another question. We haven't touched on Oman today and I apologize for that, but uh, any brief thoughts on the Oman construction market? I think the Oman market is particularly challenged at the moment in terms of, of funding. Uh, there's some movement on some PPP and private sector in engagement works. And I think if they can start to gain a bit of traction, then you'll see a bit more activity in Oman. But I would say Oman is a particularly difficult market at the moment. Okay. Um, a question here about the hotel se sector, particularly in the UAE and Saudi. Now, we know that there's a lot of overcapacity in the high end of the hotel market. Even before COVID, uh, there's a lot of overcapacity. Uh, What's your feeling on hotel construction projects in the UAE versus Saudi Arabia? 
I think in Saudi Arabia, they're building a market, which is a very different position to what the UAE and the, the UAE is in a position where they've, they've built a lot of, of assets. And it's a question of how do they make that work? And if they are going to add new properties, I think it's got to be something that's uh, really offering something different to, to what else is on offer. I think okay. just um, one other thing to add, Richard, sure. which I think is important, and I guess this is a question for the audience. We talked about Qatar and how Qatar in the past has needed another sort of line in the sand for it to aim for, for development. So in 2010, there was a bit of a question as what's happened, and then the World Cup came, and then as we described earlier, the, the LNG and the, the next Asian Games and things gives it another sort of yardstick to aim for. I, I think a similar thing exists in Dubai. So Dubai had real uh, sort of questions about what's Dubai going to do for the future in say 2012, 2013, and then along came Expo, which is, is being held at the end of this year. What sort of thing is Dubai going to do to the, really keep the economy going for the next decade? Are they going to make a big announcement at Expo? I think that I think the opportunity is certainly there. They've got the the eyes of the world will be on them with Expo. I think it's probably the, the best possible time to really um, uh, make a mark and uh, get the economy rallied behind something. So just be interested to know what people think might happen. So okay, if you just want to get in touch with me, please, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, well, I do encourage you all to get in touch with Colin uh, to pass on your thoughts, but also just to pick his brains. He's, uh, he's a great font of knowledge and we've only just tapped the, the, the tip of that iceberg uh, today. Just one final point, Colin, there's two questions that have come in about PPP and we did touch on PPP through, through the uh, conversation. Where do you, you know, PPP's had a, a, a patchy track record outside of the, the utilities sector in this region, particularly it struggled in transport. Um, it's now at the top of everyone's agendas. Which countries in the GCC do you expect to see most progress with bringing in private developers? Uh, do, do you think Saudi is going to be the lead place for PPP? Um, or do you think UAE or Kuwait might be one of the key markets? Well, I, th I think we're already seeing the answer to that question. Um, I think in Saudi Arabia, for example, you've seen the schools program. You've got tendering going on with hospitals. So I think Saudi Arabia is leading there. And I think in Abu Dhabi as well, there's some, some real progress being made also. And then pockets of, of progress elsewhere. I, I think one thing which is, is positive is I think that the PPP ambition has become a lot more realistic over the last few years. I think if we look back 10 years ago, it was trying to do very large projects as a PPP, which the, I just don't think the market was, was ready for for a number of different reasons. And now we're seeing things that are a lot more digestible uh, moving forward, and that's giving a bit, a bit of track record and uh, getting legislation and regulation in place. So uh, I, I think they're, they're smaller things that are moving forward, but a, a lot more encouraging. So it, it's sort of the, you know, walking before you can run kind of idea. Fantastic. Thank you, Colin. You, you must be exhausted. You've, you've uh, done a lot of work there. So thank you very much for your time and for your energy. And thank you to all of you uh, who've joined us today and given us your time to, to be part of the broadcast. An amazing array of questions. I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer all of your questions. I can see that there are still 27 unanswered questions in the inbox. So we will, we will circulate the, uh, those questions amongst the MEET team and we will try and answer you all uh, by email or in some other form. So thank you for that. Uh, just a reminder, a lot of the content and, and in fact the video and the slides from today you can get from the link that's now on your screen. That has also been emailed to you. You will find an email from me in your inboxes that has the same link. Uh, it gives you information about the new reports and special deals for anyone who's attended today's event uh, where you can bundle the report and a subscription to meet uh, at a special price. But if you have a look in your inbox and click on that link, um, you can get all the slides and sample pages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that's probably everything for today's broadcast. Um, thank you for attending. Thank you to Colin for his uh, hard work. And I look forward to seeing you next time. I think we have a webinar on the 9th of August is the next one. And we're going to be specifically looking at the energy transition. Uh, we've had a few questions today about sustainability and ESG and uh, the energy transition, so tune in for that one and I'll see you there.
Thank you very much. Have a great week.